Hi, I'm Ron Spromberg, co-founder and CEO of Hi Mama. Welcome to our podcast about all things early childhood education. <laughs> this week, we're on episode 36 of the Preschool Podcast. We learn about the role of the body-mind connection in early years with Ray Pika, advocate for movement-based teaching and host of the BAM Radio Network show, Student Centricity. In our conversation, we discuss the misconception that sitting equals learning. We also talk about the dire need to realign our teaching methods with scientific research that proves the positive relationship between physical experiences and how learning happens in children. If you want to learn more about how you can incorporate movement to teach language, math, and science in your classroom, then stay tuned for this episode of the Preschool Podcast. Ray, welcome to the Preschool Podcast. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for inviting me. It's our pleasure to have you on the show. And you are an expert in mind-body connection in early childhood education. And when we say that the mind and body are connected, what does that really mean? Well, it has different meanings, I suppose, in different contexts. But um, in early childhood education, so often, too often, we behave well, maybe in education period in this country, we behave as though children exist only from the neck up. And, you know, that the, the cognitive development and the brain are, are the almighty pieces of the child. And um, we ignore the fact that children have bodies. Uh, George Graham, in his book, uh, Teaching Children Physical Education, said that when he goes to schools to fight for the inclusion or the return of uh, um, physical education in, into the curriculum, he tells them, yeah, it would be great, you know, very, very cost effective to just bust their heads to school, <laughs> but they do happen to be attached to other things. And then there's a wonderful cartoon of, of um, headless children walking into the gym, you know, so we must not, the, the idea has been that we must not think in the gym or move in the classroom and it's really nonsense because more and more and more research is coming out showing that physical activity um, the body is involved in how the brain functions you know the body and the mind are not two separate entities I mean just just when we think about uh, moderate to intense level physical activity, you know, where the, the heart is pumping a little and the heart is pumping a lot. We know that that feeds the brain with oxygen, glucose, and water, and that's brain food. You know, we would never think about not feeding our bodies for days, weeks, and months at a time, but we, we do it all the time when we fail to get to our brains when we fail to get moderate to vigorous level intensity physical activity and it's 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 a tough message to get across it, it all goes back to when that philosopher Descartes said I think therefore I am and he started this mind body dualism that for some crazy reason took hold and has lasted as long as it has so that's the long answer <laughs> so Mind-body connection is really a lot about getting physical and being active. Now, it, it is. It's also about, um, especially for young children, physically experiencing concepts. Take, you know, the mathematics concepts, you know, quantitative concepts. Children need to get way up high and way down low to understand high and low. You know, <clears throat> if we're um, talking about word comprehension, they need to to move lightly and strongly, and 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 they need to act out words like enormous and tiny to really understand them. So there's also that aspect to it. Right, and I guess that's kind of to your point of you know using the physical activity in the body with intellectual activities or what we might think to be more intellectual activities and as well as using the brain when doing physical yeah cool well said 
And so <laughs> you t you talked a little bit about some of the research uh, that's behind this topic. Is there any research that's like more specific to early childhood, or is it more for school age? Um, a lot of it is just across the board, like John Rady's book Spark. Mm. Um, that's all about the science behind um, the mind-body connection and the role of physical activity in, in learning. Um, but we know that young children in particular need to physically experience concepts to really understand them. And again, with the quantitative concepts, if you look at a list of them, high and low, wide and narrow, um, strong, uh, light and heavy, what better way is there for children to experience and un come to understand those concepts than physically? You show them a word, for example, slow, which isn't a, a mathematics concept, so I'm, I'm getting into adjectives, adjectives now, but if you show them a word like slow, it has only so much meaning to them because it's just a collection of abstract symbols. Mm -hmm. But if they're moving slowly while also hearing slow music, <clears throat> that would be best because th there is research that shows the more senses we use in the learning process, the more information we retain. Mm -hmm. So, And also movement is a preschooler's preferred mode of learning. So why on earth would we ever want to teach them in any way other than their preferred way of learning? It sounds like you feel there could be a lot more uh, progress in this area. Have you, seen, have you seen any progress recently? Do you see a good trend at least where early childhood programs are adopting more of this mentality? The answer is yes and no. Uh, I see that more teachers early childhood professionals are aware of the need for movement and active learning. Um, I did a, a webinar last year that ended up being, you know, on this topic, uh, using movement to explore literacy, math, and science. And it was the number two webinar for that company uh, in 2016. So that tells me that, yes, teachers are – uh, looking for answers and they're, they're understanding the importance of this. On the other hand, we have policy that is, um, you know, you probably read the articles that kindergarten has become the new first grade, and, mm -hmm. and it's just enormously frustrating that we have so much research out there and the, the decision makers just completely ignore it. From what I understand, we're doing all kinds of wonderful research in this country, um, and people in other countries are using it and putting it, you know, putting it into effect, which mm. is just mind-boggling. Um, so we have early childhood professionals who, if they want to do what's developmentally appropriate for young children, have to fight the system now. Mm. That's why the answer is yes and no. Interesting, interesting. So there's a bit of a misalignment between what research is saying we should be doing and what we're implementing in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when you consider that um, the American Association for the Child's Right to Play, and if you can imagine we need such an association, mm -hmm. they estimate that 40% of elementary schools in the United States have um, discontinued recess have eliminated recess, oh, wow. and it's appalling. And there are states that have built and continue to build elementary schools without playgrounds. And this goes directly to the misconception that sitting equals learning. Right. And that academics are all that matters, that the, the you know, that children only exist from the neck up. It's, it's enormously frustrating, and we have so much research. We have research that shows that individuals, but particularly children, because of this stage of brain development, produce more when their efforts are distributed as opposed to concentrated. In other words, when they have breaks. Mm. And Finland is putting this brain research to use. They offer the children uh, a 15-minute break after every 45 minutes of instruction which is brilliant.
and they're at the top of the heap in terms of literacy and numeracy. Now, I usually prefer when our guests do most of the talking, but I'm going to come in with a point here because I think it's very relevant to this conversation, which is that one of the reasons we started the preschool podcast is we want to develop the future leaders of early childhood education to speak up for what should be happening in early childhood education. I just think this is a perfect example where we have a misalignment between research and practice and the early childhood educators, our audience out there, you know, this is up to you guys to go out and make the change happen because if you know that play-based learning is very important and using the senses is very important to learning in early childhood, we need to work together to push that through and make these things happen. And on that note, Ray, uh, what are some practical tips and strategies that you can provide to early childhood educators to apply the mind-body connection in their centers or in their classrooms? It's interesting when I do site visits, you know, uh, any instructional coaching, and I sit there, and it's all so obvious to me. And I think, oh, that was a perfect opportunity. I have to realize that it's obvious to me because I've been living this for, mm. you know, 37 years. Um, but acting out a story as opposed to just sitting and listening to it, um, you know, acting out the different words, as I said, word comprehension and and really, it's it's acting out anything, physically experiencing anything. Whatever content area we're talking about, there are ways for the children to experience the concepts. Now, some of them are um, more readily obvious than others. If you take uh, a content area of art, for example – shape and line and spatial relationships, those are all concepts that fall under the content area of art, and they, they align perfectly with movement. You know, the children can make their bodies into different shapes. They can form diagonal and horizontal and vertical lines with their bodies. Anytime they're moving through space, um, really can be said that they're experiencing uh, artistic concepts as well as physical ones. But then you take a, a concept like color, and it's not quite so easily recognized. But the children, children are brilliant, you know, and they're so imaginative. And if you ask them to show you with their bodies what the color yellow reminds them of, they'll show you different things. They'll show you smiley faces and pretend to be sunshine. Um, if you ask them to show you what green reminds them of, they'll show you grass or trees or uh, frogs. All kinds of possibilities come to mind. Blue could be sad. It could be cold. It could be water. It could be the sky. And my, my best advice, I think, is that we use that kind of divergent problem solving where there are lots of possible ways for the children to respond because so much of what they're going to get in their later education will be convergent problem solving where they're, they're, they're led or expected to believe there's just one right answer. And it's certainly that's the case with standardized tests. You know, one right answer, one bubble to fill in. And that just squashes creative and critical thinking skills but if you if there's lots of different ways for them to show you a round shape or you know ask ask a group of 300 children to show you a crooked shape and you could get 300 different responses and that's beautiful you know and if the teacher points out various responses they begin to understand that there is more than one way and that um that they're all right you know and and the the children begin to take more and more creative risks when when they're given those kinds of opportunities so again, whether we're talking about you know art, language arts, math, music, science, social studies, there are going to be ways to physically experience all those concepts um, that fall under them. If we just look for them, it's like if you're taking a photography course, suddenly everything you, you look at everything as a photograph. You know, mm -hmm. um, if you're if you've decided to take up writing short stories, then every everything you hear and see 
begins to seem like a possibility for a short story. If you just opened the idea of active learning, then um, then you'll start to see those possibilities as well. Right. So just thinking in that mindset, and any any activities yes. you're planning to do, think about how you can apply that in a way that's going to involve movement or the body. Yeah, because mm-hmm. sitting does not equal learning. <laughs> It's interesting, too, because a lot of this conversation, to me, kind of comes back to a very basic principle of, you know, how does learning happen? How do children learn? And the more and more I talk about this subject with experts like yourself, the more I realize we're really only at the precipice of understanding that question. (laughs) Mm, Well, you know, the the recent brain research has shown us so much that we didn't know before. I mean, before you couldn't measure um, how many parts of the brain were lighting up when children are physically active. There is um, Dr. Charles Hillman, I believe is his name, and I can't remember what university he's from. I have tweeted this uh, image a couple of times, and I've, I've used it many times. He shows a brain scan of children sitting and, you know, it's just kind of sitting there. And then, then there's a scan right beside it of, of a brain after 20 minutes of walking, just 20 mm-hmm. minutes of walking, mm-hmm. and it's all lit up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just so much more lit up. So we didn't have that before. And uh, I'm really, really grateful that we have it all. I just wish, you know, some decision makers would start paying attention. It's funny because uh, I was reading a book recently uh, called The Happiness Equation, and it's based on really great science and research, and he talks about a lot of the things that you can do to be happier, and one of them is going for a brisk 20-minute walk. Uh, And probably, Ah. yeah, and it probably has a lot to do with the same thing, right? It's igniting um, things in your brain to get you reflecting and thinking. Um, Yeah. Yeah, Eric Jensen um, has written a lot about um, learning with the the body and mind and all that sort of thing. And, you know, he talks about neuroepinephrine and and all of these chemicals that I can barely pronounce that are activated with a short jaunt around the classroom and Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, And and yet, you know, schools eliminate recess and physical education and and they keep children sitting for longer and longer and longer periods because, you know, we have all these tests to pass and all these standards to meet. And uh, it's just so contrary to what the research is showing us. So it's funny, too, because a lot of these topics are similar topics that we're talking about as adults, you know, sitting in the office uh, you know, mm-hmm. we got to get moving more. Taking those breaks and being healthy is going to activate the mind. Um, so it's almost like a universal problem, but it's even that much more important for early childhood education where that learning and that fundamental early years is so important. Exactly, because they're not, they're not um, abstract thinkers yet. They're right. concrete thinkers, you know, so we have to give them concrete experiences. It's funny you mentioned, you know, the, the adults sitting in the office. We have new research showing how, I mean, it's really scary, the negative effect of, of sitting. Even if you work out every day, they say, if you hmm. spend most of your days sitting, there are a whole host of health problems that can arise. And so I have stopped sliding the, the office chair over to the printer to turn it on. You know, hmm. now I stand up. And while we're talking, I'm walking. Mm. I'm, I'm, I've got the, the phone in my hand, and I'm, I'm wearing a hole in the carpet here, <laughs> just walking, <laughs> walking back and forth, because I think better yep. when I'm moving, and I, I'm not alone in that. Totally. Now, this is a really interesting topic that I feel like we really just scratched the surface. If people who are listening want to learn more about this topic, where are some resources for them to go find out more? Well, in, in terms of books, I would absolutely recommend Eric Jensen's book. He's brilliant, um, and he's really on top of the mind-body connection. Uh, I have written for uh, Griffin House, um, Jump Into Literacy, Jump Into Science, Jump Into Math, and I wanted to prove that there were ways to explore all these concepts. And those are activity books. And I know early childhood people are always glad to have those. 
and I've just started a YouTube channel, which oh, cool. um, was <laughs> it was very it was challenging to learn how to do all of that technological stuff. But having done it, I'm I'm really proud of myself. Um, and having always said I've you know I've got a face for radio, it was a little hard <laughs> to put it out there on YouTube. But it's called Active Learning with Ray, and I think if you just went to YouTube and uh, put Ray Pika in the search box. I've only got two um, videos up so far, an introduction to active learning and then an introduction to using transitions, um, to using movement for transitions to make them less chaos-filled and more learning-filled. And uh, another one will go up this week. I'm going to put one up every other week is the plan. And they will be activities that teachers can use with the children. Um, active learning activities under Wonderful. different content areas. Yeah. That sounds like a great resource. Well, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. The response when I mentioned it on Facebook was pretty welcoming, so that was that was good. Yeah, like you said, anytime where we have activities that we can, can use or, or get the creative juices flowing too, right? Yes, yes. Um, the hope is that, you know, my ideas will stimulate yours you know the the teachers um and and like we said start looking at things with active learning in mind hey this has been a really great conversation ray uh i'm personally very passionate about the idea of taking science and research and applying that in early childhood education i think you really brought that to light here today in this conversation so thanks so much for coming on the show oh thank you and and early childhood people need to be um you know, they're not policy wonks. They're not always comfortable with policy, but they do need to tell their stories. And to as many people as will listen, because so many others think that they're just babysitters. So they have to let people know and invite policymakers to their classrooms to see what active learning and developmentally appropriate practice look like. So that's, that's my final word. <laughs> yes, and a good final word at that. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Ron. What's your name? Michaela. Michaela, how are you? Hi. You having fun playing? Yeah. It's a nice day, isn't it? Yes. Yes. What's your favorite thing to play out here? Playing monsters. You like to play monsters? Do you like to swing? Okay. What else do you like to do? Play my Dora bike. Oh, with your Dora bike? Oh, okay.